Classes in Statistical Mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 9, The Grand Canonical Ensemble. I'm Professor Phillies. These are classes on statistical mechanics. Today we're going to be discussing Lecture 9 of my book. Lecture 9 is Open Systems and Grand, the Grand Canonical Ensemble. The book, of course, is Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics. Okay, so today we are going to discuss an advance over the canonical ensemble. The advance over the canonical ensemble is forced by the existence in the world of doorways. The point of a doorway is that the molecules can enter and leave the room, the volume V, and therefore in real systems it is not always the case that the volume V is fixed. Or more perhaps sensibly said, it is not always the case that within the volume V the number of particles is fixed. We'll mostly take the latter perspective instead of saying as the atoms enter and leave where our volume is invading their volume, we will take the perspective that as the enter molecules enter and leave, the number of particles in the room keeps changing. Well, this is very good. If there were no doorways, we'd be trapped in here permanently now, wouldn't we? Okay, well, having said that, I will make a minor aside here. We're going to talk about, eventually introduce constants mu and p, the chemical potential and the pressure. Mu and p in the grand canonical ensemble are not the same as the mu and the p we introduced in the canonical ensemble. In the canonical ensemble, the chemical pressure, chemical potential and the pressure come from the derivatives of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to the number of particles in the volume. Here they're going to do something slightly different. They're very close, but you want to be alert that they're not quite the same. Okay, so what we are going to do is to discuss an open system. So how do we do that? And the historical answer is we take the, the open system and we put it inside a larger closed system. And so we take the closed system, which is very large, and we divide it into two pieces, a region 1, which is the region we're interested in, and a region 2, which is the region we're not interested in. Eventually we talk about taking the limit that the region 2 was made infinitely large. That limit is not trivial. In fact, under some conditions, it doesn't work. However, we did, so we are going to divide the system into two regions. Um, if I tell you that the number of particles in the whole system is n, then there are n1 particles in one part and n2 in the other part. We are now up to equation 9.2. And similarly, I can say if we've divided the volume into two parts, there's a volume V1 and a volume V2 of the two parts. And those V1 and V2 add up to V. I trust this is not too surprising. We now come to the complicated part, which is the energy of the system. And the assertion is that the energy can be divided adequately, accurately, into two parts, E1 and E2. The energy of the particles in the first part and the energy of the particles in the second part. Now, for kinetic energy, this is entirely um, trivial, namely the kinetic energy is attached to a particle. We have some scheme for assigning a particle to being in volume 1 or volume 2. Of course, if this is the particle and the division between the two volumes is here, we need a formal definition that tells us whether this particle is in volume 1 or volume 2. You could, for example, use the center of mass, but clearly, if the volumes are large and this is our one atom, 
the, the number of atoms that are going to be sitting right on the boundary is not going to be very big. And the more complicated part of this, though, is the potential energy. The reason the potential energy is complicated is that an atom here, in volume 2, here is the boundary, can interact with a second atom, atom 1, in volume 1. And these two atoms are on opposite sides of the, the um, division between volume 1 and volume 2. They have a joint potential energy, and the question is, um, how do you deal with that if you want to say the energy in each volume is, is, can be calculated in terms of the positions of the particles in that volume? The answer is there's a surface energy. The treatment we're going to do here ignores surface energy. If the volumes are large and we do not have long-range forces, a long-range force is a term with an exact meaning, which we'll get to. And if the surfaces are simple in shape, you know, one partition across a container, there's no problem. On the other hand, suppose I have a ton of fine powdered sand. But it's a ton, it's very big, but the surface area is huge, and the surface area may or may not be negligible. In thermodynamics, there is a scheme, which if I recall correctly, is assigned to Gibbs, for partitioning the energy of the system into two parts, and assigning a surface where it makes everything come out right. In statistical mechanics, there are treatments of surfaces. We simply don't get to them here. Okay, so we're going to say the molecules have a potential energy. How do we write the potential energy? And that's equation 9.4. The potential energy is a function of where all of the particles in the system are. But what we say in this is that we can split the poten potential energy into types of terms. There are pair terms. Uh, the Coulomb energy is a pair potential. It depends on the position of exactly two charges. The Coulomb potential is also a long-range potential. It is one of the things that causes us trouble, but it is a pair potential. Then there are three-body potentials. By three-body potentials, we mean that the potential energy of three bodies is not the sum of the potential energy of bodies taken two at a time. Now you may wonder, I've never heard of this thing, is it ever significant? Well, the first answer is, if you have three atoms nearby, and you calculate, um, the quantum mechanics may be described as the positions of the electron clouds fluctuate with respect to the nuclei, two fluctuating dipoles can attract each other, or repel each other, and therefore, there's a two, this is the van der Waals energy, and there's a third term, there, if there are three bodies, three fluctuating dipoles do not behave like the sum of, th of three pairs of dipoles. It's more complicated. You can write the interactions that way, but if you try to do a thermal average, life gets interesting. Um, three body energies are important. Suppose we consider the simplest of all liquids. That's liquid argon. The, ele it's, the electron cloud is hard. Argon is heavy enough, atomic weight 40, that there aren't significant quantum corrections. And we ask, how much does the three-body potential of argon, which is small because the um, electron clouds are fairly rigid, as opposed to xenon, where the electron clouds are s sort of soft, in a sense. And the answer is that the three-body potential ter in terms are about, oh, 20 or 30 percent of the total um, contribution to the thermodynamic free energy. They're large. If you do dynamics calculations, they're even larger. Three-body terms are very large indeed. Now, there are ways of making them go away. If you take the liquid argon and heat it up to a temperature 
found in the core of a star. I don't know why you'd conceivably want to do that. Um, but if you heat the it up to that sort of a temperature, all of the electrons let go of their nuclei and wander around at random. And in that case, you can write the potential as a sum of pair terms. Okay, so we have talked about the energy. Um, I, am, I said long range potential energy. What is the distinction? And the distinction is whether the potential energy falls off with distance faster than 1 over r cube or slower than 1 over r cube or if it's really mean and falls off exactly as 1 over r cube, in which case uh, you actually need to know what you're doing. Why do we care about 1 over r cube of all numbers? Here is an atom. Let us compute the potential of energy of this atom with respect to all of the other atoms that you can't see in space. So. There's an atom here, and we can imagine it surrounding it by a set of, of spherical shells, mathematical spherical shells, uh, like stadium seats. They're not necessarily atoms in any particular place, but we're going to look at the spherical shell. The volume of a spherical shell of a fixed thickness grows as r squared. Yes? This shouldn't be surprising. However, the potential energy of two atoms, if they're short range, falls off as faster than 1 over r cube. So what is the total potential energy of this atom with respect to all of the atoms in a shell out here? And the answer is that there's a 1 over r bigger than 3 times an r to the plus 2, because yes, each atom out here interacts weakly, but there are r squared more of them. And the net result is the interaction energy of this atom with the atoms in a spherical shell out here, fall, the total energy of all of the atoms in that shell, falls off faster than 1 over r. Because you've got r squared more and more atoms, but the interaction of each with this falls off like 1 over r cube and then some, and therefore the total energy falls off faster than 1 over r. If you integrate something that is 1 over r to the power larger than 1, dr, that's a well-defined integral, and it, it converges. It's well-behaved. On the other hand, suppose the potential energy only falls off as 1 over r. There are two potentials that do this, electrostatics and gravity. In that case, the potential energy falls off as 1 over r. There are r square atoms more and more in each shell. The po total potential energy grows with a distance and is dominated by the atoms that are off at infinity and is instantly divergent if you're in a uniform system. Mm, how does nature handle this problem? The answer is there are two completely different approaches that nature has found. The first is for a Coulomb system. It, electrically charged systems are more or less, this is not perfectly correct, but close enough, electrically neutral. They have as many positive charges as negative charges. If we have a uniform shell of atoms way out here, it has as many positive as negative atoms in here, out there, and therefore the interaction of all of these atoms with the atom in the center is some number close to zero. To make life even better, if say this atom is positively charged, it tends to repel other positively charged atoms and attract negatively charged atoms. This is not what is known as Debye screening, which is a plasma behavior, which we will get to. And as a result, this positive ion tends to have negative ions around it, more than positive. 
Now apply Gauss's law to a surface out here. Gauss's law says the electrical field across this surface is determined by the total elect charge inside. And if there are extra minus ions out here and a positive ion there, the net result is that the charge that is seen by the Gauss's law surface is much smaller than the charge on this thing. And in fact, <coughs> you convert a Coulomb potential, a 1 over R potential, to a potential that falls off exponentially with distance, approximately. Uh, gravity is different. There are no negative charges except on gravitational charges, except on Star Trek, which does not count. And therefore, what happens? The answer is that a gravitational system does not behave like other systems. It does not, if you just had gravitating point charges, the initial uniform system does not stay at thermal equilibrium. Instead, some of the charges glom up closer and closer together, going to more and more negative potential energies. Yes? Uh, the, the energy is converted into kinetic energy, and there are particles out here in the open spaces in between, mostly, that are going faster and faster and have more of the kinetic energy. <clears throat> if you let things go on, you observe that there are density waves and clusters forming, and so an initially uniform system turns into something that's highly non-uniform with a lot of structure. You know, globular things called galaxies, and less globular things because groups of galaxies have structure. Um, there is some supposition that there is a largest distance scale on which we have structure, and the largest distance scale has actually been observed. So, <clears throat> in any event, <coughs> gravity doesn't work that way either. Well, we won't talk about gravitational systems. We'll get to Coulomb systems eventually. Um, we're just going to talk about more conventional chemical systems. Okay, so let us push ahead and let us look at figure 9-2 on page 127. <clears throat> and we have gone into the system and we have divided it into two parts, the left of which is volume 1, the right of which is volume 2. And upstairs, we have a system containing four unlabeled, meaning identical, particles. However, while we're doing calculations, we can't do them on unlabeled particles. We have to keep track of them and then correct for the fact that we labeled them. Yes? So, this state above actually corresponds, for example, to the four systems labeled below in which the particles 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 each separately go through all of their possible positions. <clears throat> it also corresponds to the system in systems shown in figure 9-3 in which now atoms 1 and 3 are on one side and atoms 2 and 4 are on the other. That is if we say in the big volume V with n particles if the particles are identical and the labels don't count, the actual state is figure 9-1. But there are lots of ways, if you label the particles, of generating it. Now we ask <coughs> the question, <coughs> suppose we would like to find the probability of finding a state of the volume V1. That is, we have N1 particles in V1. Yes? And they each have a momentum and they each have a position and we would like to identify the probability of finding a particular state for V1. So how do we do that? Well, <coughs> first of all, we don't care what V2 is doing. 
we can immediately write down what is the probability of finding n atoms in a volume V, all with their own momentum. It's e to the minus beta energy of all n1 plus n2 particles. And you need a 1 over n factorial, and there's an h to some power because of the quantum effects that we eventually get to. <coughs> but you can write that down. And that's the probability of one state of the big system. Yes? But we're only interested in the probability of one state of the small system. Well, first of all, for each state of the small system, there are lots and lots of ways the particles in the other part of the system in V2 could be doing things. And so what we take, do is we add up over all of the states of volume 2. Because it doesn't matter what state you're in, they, they all get, are giving you at the moment the same state of volume 1. And if you look at equation 9.7, you see exactly that. Namely, there's this integral over volume from the numerator, volume 2, over all of the positions and all of the momentums of the n2 particles in volume 2. And that integral is confined to volume 2 because we're referring only to the particles in volume 2. There's also in the same place a denominator and what the denominator refers to is that is the total probability for all capital N particles being someplace in the full volume V. That's the canonical partition system for n particles in volume V. <coughs> in front of that, there's a 1 over n factorial h to the 3n, and that's simply for capital N particles in volume V. You get that. <coughs> there's an exponential minus beta E1. Why is that out in front? Well, we're doing an integral over the n2 particles in volume V2, yes? E1 is a function only of the positions of the particles in volume 1. So when we add up over all of the positions of the particles in volume V2, x minus beta E1 is just a constant and can be factored out. It's a constant with respect to the coordinates of the particles in volume <clears throat> and now we finally have the sum, uh, curly bracket n1 comma n2, the summation in front of everything else. And the question is, what is that summation? Well, the answer is as follows. <clears throat> it's not necessarily the case that atoms 1, 2, 3 through n1 are in volume 1, and atoms n1 plus 1, n1 plus 2, out through n1 plus n2, are in volume 2. If we just want n1 particles at particular locations in volume 1, we're asking about figure 9.1. And figure 9.1 includes all of the different ways of putting some n1 particles in volume 1, and sum n2 particles in volume 2. So what we have to do is to add up all of the possible ways we can have labeled the particles in volume 1 and volume 2 so we catch not only figure 9.2, in which case it's volume figures, excuse me, atoms 1 and 2 in volume 1, we also add up and pick up figure 9.3, the next page, in which it's atoms 1 and 3 in volume 1. And we add up over all of those choices because all of those choices of labels give us n1 atoms, some n1 atoms in volume 1. Okay? Of course, that's an ugly sum. So we sort of wish we could clean it up a bit. And the question is, how do we clean it up a bit? Okay. Well, what do we do? One thing we can do is to go in with an eraser. And what we say is that 
we will go through all of the terms of 9.7, that funny double sum. And we will write them all down. And then after we have written them all down, we will get, go in with eraser and pencil, and we will renumber atoms. And we will renumber the atoms so that the atoms in volume 1 are always 1 through n1, and the atoms in n2 are always n1 plus 1 through n2. I'm, that is, I'm going to do a relabeling. I can tell which atom is which, but I'm simply going to change the license plates around, so to speak. Yes? Mm -hmm. And when I do this, well, that would mean, for example, I would take um, the states in figure 9.3, I would switch atoms 2 and 4 around, and if I switch ad excuse me, atoms 2 and 3 around, so I would move atom 2 to volume 1 and atom 3 to volume 2. And I would end up with extra copies of, figure, of some of the states in figure 9.2. <coughs> yes. So I've now generated extra copies of some of those terms. However, if I do this in a sensible way, I generate the same number of copies of each of those terms. And all I have to worry about is, well, how many copies of each of those terms did I generate? Yes. And that is a bit of a puzzle now, isn't it? How are we going to do that? Well, there is a math trick which generates the answer to this. And it's a very odd math trick we are going to consider a binomial, A plus B. And, except it's going to be A1 plus B1, A2 plus B2, and so forth. It doesn't have to be. That's not central. And we will take the binomial, and we will expand out all of the terms. And then we will collect all of the terms determined by how many A's and how many B's we have. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, all of the terms that have, say, 13 A's and capital N minus 13 B's sh each show a state of the system in which there are 13, some 13 atoms in volume 1. Yes? And if you think about the way binomials work, We've generated all of the terms of the binomial, and therefore the binomial includes a list of 2 to the capital N terms. It includes all of the terms um, in which there are some identified 13 atoms in volume 1. Yes? So far, so good? Mm -hmm. So, this binomial is isomorphic to that list of all states of the system which put 13, some 13 atoms in volume 1. Namely, it, is, it shows a list of 13 integers, 13 identified atoms in, uh, of the type A. So far, so good. This is a slightly bizarre argument, and some people have trouble seeing it. But the point is, the list of all terms of the double sum in equation 9.7, in terms of generating an enumerated list of which atoms are in volume 1, is exactly the same as the list of terms of the binomial. Yes? They don't look like each other. There are no integrals. There are no potential energies in the binomial. But the list of numbers is the same. So far, so good. Now I am going to go in, and I am going to delete all of the terms, of all of the subscripts on all of the A's and B's. So I don't care which A's are in volume 1 and which B's are in volume 2. I'm going to delete all of the subscripts, and then I am going to 
simply write down subscripts on the A's so they're labeled A1 through A13. And the B's can be labeled, I guess, or B14 through the rest. Yes? Well, I will generate a whole lot of copies of A1, A2, dot, 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 A13, won't I? How many will I generate? And that answer is supplied by the binomial theorem. Equation 9.9. .9. Because equation 9.9 .9 tells us that if I take A plus B to the N, I get a certain number of terms of A to the I, B to the N minus I. And how many is it? Well, it's the <coughs> coefficient in that summation. It's N factorial divided by I factorial N minus I factorial. Binomial theorem. Now, I'm, using the bin I'm not using it to calculate the polynomial. I'm using it to tell me what one of the terms looks like. The term that puts exactly N1 particles in volume V1. And the binomial theorem tells me how many copies of that term I generated when I reshuffled all of the labels. I don't move the atoms. I just reshuffle the labels. And I get n factorial over i factorial and minus i factorial. So far so good? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let us go to equation 9.7. And we are going to delete the sum over all combinations of n1 particles in one side and n2 in the other because it's particles, now particles, 1 through n1 in volume 1. When I do that, I pick up a whole bunch of terms, and, what, and I can replace the double sum, this complicated sum, just with the coefficient from the binomial theorem, n factorial over n1 factorial, n2 factorial. Yes? Mm -hmm. So I now have it so that the first n1 particles are in volume 1, the remainder are in volume 2, and I have simply counted how many identical terms there were to get there. Oh, but what happens when I do that? The n factorial in the numerator of 9.9 .9 delete, uh, ca cancels the n factorial in the denominator of 9.7. The two n factorials cancel. And I am left with a 1 over n1 factorial and a 1 over n2 factorial, which I have written out in equation 9-10. Yes? Mm -hmm. And so the probability of finding a particular state for the n1 atoms in 1, that's what equation 9-10 tells us, is 1 over h to the 3n1 n1 factorial, exponential minus beta e1, times the sum over the probability for all of the states of, um, atom of volume 2 correctly weighted. There's also a denominator. Oh, by the way, there's a mistake in the denominator. It's missing a 1 over h to the 3n n factorial, and that mistake is repeated in the next equation. <coughs> so far, so good? So it's a 1 over h to the 3n? n factorial in the denominator. When you over h to the 3n n okay. factorial? Yes. Okay. Like this. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Now if you look at that, it looks as if you said, simply said, the atoms in the volume 1 are distinguishable from the atoms in volume 2, even though they're identical. You would naturally write down 9-10, because 9-10 says that all of the particles in at volume 1 are indistinguishable from each other, all of the atoms in volume 2 are indistinguishable from each other, and therefore we need the two 1 over n factorials for those two terms. And you can find people who actually do this. There's only one problem. You cannot make atoms distinguishable by drawing imaginary mathematical lines through space. 
They're all indistinguishable, and you have to treat that correctly, and we have just done this. Okay, what do we do now? The next thing we do is to remember what the canonical partition function looks like. The canonical partition function Q of NVT is given by equation 9.11. And it's the sum over all of the states, integral DRN, DPN, e to the minus beta energy, and you divide out the quantum bits. And this is the same as exponential minus beta A, which is the last piece of 9.11. However, exponential minus beta A is the Helmholtz free energy for capital N particles in volume V at temperature T. Yes? So the d denominator piece of 9-10 is simply the canonical partition function for the N particles in volume V. Because that's where we started with it. But we have another piece. Look upstairs at 9-10 and there's, some, there's an integral dr n1 plus 1. Everything from there to the end of the equation, that expression is also a canonical partition function. Well, it is, well, it's mathematically equal to the partition function for n2 particles in volume v2. Yes? And so we'll do those two replacements, and we come to equation 9-12. And 9-12 is the same as equation 9-10, except I have replaced the two huge integrals with the fact that those two integrals are equal to canonical partition functions. So far so good? Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Okay. Well, the Q's can be replaced with e to the minus beta A's. And the e to the minus beta a in the denominator can be taken upstairs. Of course, if you take e to the minus beta a upstairs, it becomes e to the minus beta minus a. And that's what you see in 913. I have replaced the q's, the partition functions, with a, the Helmholtz free energies, and I have replaced, uh, I have simply, gotten rid of the annoying and unnecessary fraction. Now, this is th what you are looking at at the moment. So far, everything we have done is mathematically exact. The next piece, um, assuming the partition function is convergent, we're good. The next piece is we will limit ourselves to the cases where n1 is much less than n and v1 is much less than v. That is, we are limiting ourselves to the case where the system of interest is very small, the space outside the doorway, the Earth's atmosphere, is very big, and therefore n1 and v1 are much less than n and v. Now, I've done something else in 913 I didn't point out. If you look at 913 and compare with 912, in 9-12 you have N2, V2, T and upstairs, yes? Mm -hmm. Well, I've just replaced in 913 N2 with N minus N1 mm -hmm. and V2 with V minus V1. That's, uh, that's perfectly okay. <coughs> But the next step is a little more radical. If n is, n1 is much less than n, and v1 is much less than v, what can I do? Ignore one of them. Ignore n1. Well, you could. Um, that's equivalent to volume 1 being a little box full with vacuum. We need something a little more dra uh, less drastic than that, just a little. Moving particles into V1 has no effect on the density of particles in V2. That's true, too. I was going to do something else. I was going to say, well, I can do a Taylor series expansion. I have a small pair of small variables, N1 and V1. And therefore, I can do a Taylor series expansion of 
in 9-13, the first Helmholtz free energy term, A of n minus n1. Okay? And I can do a Taylor series expansion around n. Of course, that requires that A be well behaved, so I can get away with this. And if dA dn or dA dV was zero, I'd better think carefully about what I'm doing because there might be negative implications. Nonetheless, I can do a Taylor series expansion because I am in the thermodynamic limit. How do I make this result always work? I take the limit, n goes to infinity, v goes to infinity, n over v is a constant. So I make the outer vault system enormous, infinite. Okay, so having done that, 914 shows you the Taylor series expansion. That is, the left side of the equation is the thing we're going to expand, and after we've expanded it, there's an A, and there are the two linear terms, and I quit with the two linear terms. Um, I will then symbolically look, oh, there are two derivatives there, aren't they? Partial of a with respect to n and v. And I replace those with mu, the chemical potential, and p, the pressure. You should recognize that the mu and p here, um, we have seen mu and p before, and this mu and p are just variables we have stuck in. They are very close to the p we calculated in um, chapter 6. Mu is very close to the chemical potential we didn't really calculate because that's actually quite turns out to be tricky to do. I mean, if you change the number of particles, you change the number of integral, si integral signs. And saying um, we will change the number of integral signs in a continuous way doesn't really make sense. You have to be do something smarter called a charging process. Well, in any event, we have those derivatives. And so we take 914. We substitute 915 into it so we can just write mu and p instead of those derivatives. We plug that back into 913. And then we notice something. 913 has a minus a of nvt in it the minus a that was the old denominator. 914 um, has an a minus n1 mu minus v1, that's actually plus v1p. The a n v t shows up twice with opposing terms and signs rather and cancels. So there's no a left. And since there is no a left, um, only those derivatives, we end up, after we do all the cancellations, with equation 9-16, which says that the probability of a particular configuration in volume 1, well, there's a 1 over h to the 3n1, that's quantum mechanics. There's a 1 over n1 factorial, because those particles are indistinguishable. There's an exponential minus beta e, 1, which has been the weight all along. And then there is this funny extra term um, that tells us the importance of states with different values of n1. So far, so good. OK. Our further piece is a symbol. It is shown in equation 9-17. Z is the fugacity of the system. I have given you its definition. It's e to the beta mu. Um, it's a net term. It's a different. There's no new physics here. It's just a new symbol. However, the point of the symbol is that I can replace e to the beta mu n1 with z to the n1. Does this make a difference? Well, it doesn't make a physics difference. Does it make a math difference? Yes, it's going to let me more easily see a power series in Z. 
I, mean, I could see a power series and powers of e to the beta mu, but that gets hard to see sometimes. A power series in z to the n1 is easier to see. Okay, we are now at 9-18. Having reached 9-18, we then say, well, suppose we add up all of, all of the possible states represented by 9-18. So we will integrate over all of the positions and momenta that all of the n1 particles could have. Yes. Also, we will add up over all of the possible values of n1. 0, 1, 2, 3. So we have just added up over all of the possible states of the system. What is that total probability? It's the total probability of all possible states of the big system, which is where we started, which is <coughs> 1. Mm -hmm. So the total is 1, and that gives us the equation 9-19. And what I then say is, I am going to divide equation 9-18 by equation 9-19. Now, to a certain extent, if you think about this, uh, equation 9-19... <coughs> Yes. So it, equation 9-18 was already normalized. So when I divide by equation 9-19, I am dividing by 1. Mm -hmm. And absolutely nothing is going to happen. However, what does happen is shown by equation 9-20. And what happens in equation 9-20 is and I take 9-19, I shove it into the denominator of 918, and then in, the, in 919 I replace w of 1 with its actual value in 918. And if you look hard, I have done that. And you will get its homework to show that 9-20 follows from 9-18. Are there any tricks that make this worth doing? Well, the major trick is noting that e to the minus beta PV cancels between the numerator and the denominator. That's almost but not quite obvious. Remember, e to the minus beta PV, beta is the temperature, it's a constant. P is the pressure, it's just a parameter. V is a constant. Um, it's constant. It can factor out in front of all of those summations, and so it cancels between numerator and denominator. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, now we say in 9-20 there is that very complicated sum over n. And that sum is over all of the possible number of particles that could be in, the vo in volume 1. As a notational issue, except it got a bit messy, maybe I should have called the summation variable, and no, I shouldn't have. That's probably the best way to do it. So there's this summation downstairs, which is the normalizing factor, but let's look at that summation on n for a second. There's a 1 over h to the 3n n factorial. There's a z to the n, which is just a constant relative to all of the integrations, but not to the sum. And then there's an integral drn dpn e to the minus beta e1. Uh, what's that integral drn dpn times other things? It's the canonical, it's the canonical partition function. See it? Mm -hmm. Well, I will replace the canonical partition function with its symbol q of nvt. The z to the n just sits there. Mm -hmm. And this denominator becomes 9-21, the grand canonical partition function. I've written out what the grand canonical partition function is. It's a z to the n q n, and now we sum over all values of n. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I've introduced a new partition function, and this one has a feature. And the feature is identified by 
plugging 9-18 into 9-19, and if you plug 9-18 into 9-19, uh, you notice that sitting there on the, right, on the left side of the equation is the grand canonical partition function multiplied by e to the minus beta pv. You should do this for yourself. It's homework. And what I do is to say, to get to 9-22, we'll take the e to the minus beta pv by multiplication to the other side of the equation, and I find that the canonical, grand canonical partition function is e to the plus beta pv. Okay? pv1 has a name and a symbol. The symbol is j. The name is the grand potential. Psi, the grand canonical partition function, is exactly like Q in one important respect. It's not normalized. It has a numerical value. Q is e to the minus beta A. Psi is e to the beta J. And then I give you 9-23, which you can confirm by doing algebra. And you just do the algebra on those two objects, on the log of psi, and you find that um, by taking derivatives of log psi, you can get out the average number of particles in the system, and you can get out the energy minus n1 mu. Okay? Oh, there's a last simplification. And the last simplification is to say we will take the thermodynamic limit, and therefore, in equation 9-21, instead of having a sum from 0 to capital N, we will have a sum from 0 to infinity. Is that legal? Well, what we're saying is that instead of saying that we only have the entire Earth's atmosphere out there, we have ascended into the Empyrean, and outside the door is an infinitely large space all filled with air. And does this make a difference? Well, yes. Instead of just being able to have the state in which all of the Earth's atmosphere is inside this room, we could have a state in which there are an infinite number of particles inside this room. And the question is, um, is that, does that change the convergence of the sum? Finite sums are well behaved because Q is well behaved. But if we replace the finite sum with an infinite sum, is it convergent? Uh, Gibbs used the argument, you know, atoms are incompressible and occupy space, and therefore even if you work really hard, you can only get so many atoms into this room. We would say, Suppose we use hydrogen. You take hydrogen and you compress it and you compress it and the electron orbitals start to overlap and there are all of these ionized states in which the electrons are out here and the protons are here. Of course the ionized states are very high energy so they're not real probable. But there are an incredible number of them. And the question is does incredible number overwhelm low probability? This is a hard problem. It was solved when I was a graduate student, or maybe an undergraduate, I forget. And people then had to engross the, sc the scrolls with all of the journal articles on them and rubricate and illuminate the scrolls. And the answer is, the integral is convergent as long as one of the charged species is a fermion spin one-half, which of course electrons are. If you had a system of charged particles and none of the charged particles were fermions, this does not appear to be possible in the real world, there would be a convergence problem. So that's the answer on convergence, and I give you the reference. The additional homework, since I haven't handed you too much yet, is problems 1 through 5, 9 dash 1 through 9 dash 5. Um, 9 dash 2 is a little tedious. 
Um, 9 dash 3 is mostly units manipulation. Um, you're invited to combine 9 dash 39 with lecture 7 and you get energy fluctuations out. Uh, 9 dash 5 is yet another derivation of the ideal gas law. Okay, I'd say those